You're listening to a message delivered at First Family Church in Bondurant, Iowa, from a sermon series, Son of God, Servant of Man, going through the Gospel of Mark. For more information and messages, please visit our website at www.ffcblife.com. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be back in our uh, series where this is uh, the second message of the Gospel of Mark, where we have entitled this series, The Son of God and the Servant of Man. So open your Bible to Mark chapter 1, and I'll be reading from verses 9 through 11. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Here's what it says. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son. In you, I am well pleased. You know how there are things in life that don't make sense? I'm talking about the things that we know are true, but we just don't get it. For example, airplanes. How in the world do airplanes fly? Now, they say that the engines are designed to move the plane forward at a high speed. And when that happens, the airflow that goes over the wings, right, pushes downward to the ground, generating an upward force that they call lift. And that enables the plane to fly and stay in the air. So the engines move the plane forward and the wings move it upward. Okay, that's what they say. I still don't get how a machine that weighs over 150,000 pounds can fly. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I believe it, right? If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't get on a plane. And I frequently do get on a plane. I just, I believe it. I just don't get it. Then there's the fact that the Patriots keep winning the Super Bowl. I mean, what gives? I mean, there, there's 31 other NFL teams out there. Can't one of them beat the Patriots? It's very puzzling to me. Or how about this one? The fact that so many people like country music. Now, I know I just probably stepped on some toes. I mean, there's the, the, the FCC says there's about 15,000 radio stations in the U.S. And about 4,000 of those radio stations play country music. I don't get it. Why would you brag about the fact that you have friends in low places? I I think I would keep that to myself. I mean, that's just sad. Or how about this one? You name the babies, and I'll name the dogs. You heard that song? I mean, come on. I mean, you're willing to name your dogs, but not your children? I mean, I don't get that. I mean, the popularity of country music is a true fact. I just don't get it. Now, this morning's passage is kind of like that. It's kind of like something that we know is true, but we don't always understand why it happened, right? We're looking at the baptism of Jesus this morning. And we're going to see that Jesus was baptized, and as we study it carefully... Hopefully we'll understand why that took place. So we're looking at the baptism of Jesus this morning. I will be taking questions, so if you want to send those in, text those in, I'll do my best to answer those at the end of the message. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to in verse 9 of Mark chapter 1 is what I call the profound humility of Jesus. The profound humility of Jesus. Of Jesus. Now, Mark's account of Jesus' baptism is very brief. It's not that long. It's only three verses as we read. We're going to be looking at some other gospel references that give us some more 
uh, information and more color on the baptism of Jesus because Mark doesn't say that much. But just because Mark's account is very brief, it doesn't mean that it's not penetrating or profound. So the profound humility of Jesus, this is what I mean. The text tells us that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. Now we're very familiar with the fact that Jesus is from the little town of Nazareth. What you may not know is that Nazareth was a very small town. Um, It's not mentioned in any first century writings outside of the Bible. And it's estimated that the population was about 500 people. So not a very significant town. We're also told in the text that Nazareth is in the region of Galilee. Galilee was the northern region of Israel. Now Galilee was considered to be a not-so-nice place among the Jews, particularly the the Jews of Jerusalem, where the temple was, and where a lot of Judaism centered, right? They considered Galilee to be an unclean, unholy place, and the reason why is because it was overrun by Gentiles. Now, we may not understand this, but to the Jews of the first century, Gentiles, that's non-Jews, were considered unclean, ceremonially unclean, not able to approach the living God through the temple or worship Him that way. They were considered unclean as well as unholy sinners. In fact, the Jews of Jerusalem even looked down on other Jews that lived in Galilee. Even Nathaniel, if you remember from John chapter 1, said, can anything come, anything good come from Nazareth? Why would he say that? Well, because it's a small town And it's in Galilee where all those unclean, unholy people people are. And yet this is where Jesus is from. A small, obscure town. We know that he came from a poor, poor family that lived on the proverbial other side of the tracks. And yet, as we have seen from the beginning of the book of Mark, Jesus is the very Son of the living God. He is the awaited Messiah that Israel had been waiting for for hundreds of years. He is king of the Jews, and as you know, he is king of the universe because he's God. So he comes from Galilee to John who is baptizing in the Jordan to be baptized. As he comes from Galilee, he comes to his, what we know his, to be his cousin, his cousin, John the Baptist. And it appears as though, as we see, that, that uh, if, as we look at other passages, that John hadn't, maybe, maybe hadn't met Jesus before, or at least hadn't seen him in a long time, and maybe didn't know him as an adult. Maybe knew him as a child, but it appears not as an adult. And the reason I say this is, in John chapter 1, verse 33, John the Baptist says this about Jesus. He says, I did not recognize him. Listen to this. But he who sent me, that's God, to baptize in water, said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So it appears that John had never seen Jesus as an adult. And and that would kind of make sense because John the Baptist's parents were older when he was born. Perhaps they were already dead at this point, which probably explains why he was able to live in the wilderness and not have to take care of his parents. So as Jesus comes to John, we know from the book of Matthew that John didn't want to baptize him. In fact, look at this. This comes from Matthew's account of the baptism in Matthew chapter 3 verse 14, and it says this, but John, that's the Baptist, tried to prevent him that's Jesus, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Now, the phrase tried to prevent. It's written in such a way that it literally means that he repeatedly tried to prevent Jesus from being baptized. He was saying, no, this isn't right. Several times. Now, why would John do this? Why would he prevent Jesus from being baptized. Think about it. It's because John knew that Jesus had no sin, 
right? What do we read from the beginning of Mark chapter 1? What was John preaching? Look at verse 4, if you have your Bible open. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, right? He was commanding people to agree with God that their offenses, that their trespasses were sin in in the sight of a holy God And we learned last week, in order to express that confession and that agreement with God about their sin, is that he commanded them to be baptized, this outward sign of sorrow and repentance for an inward reality, right? But John has already said uh, earlier in verse 7, he says, One's coming after me that is mightier than I. And that's Jesus who comes. John knows that he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And yet here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the very Son of God, to be baptized. Why does Jesus need to be baptized? I think at this point we can kind of sympathize with John. We probably ask ourselves the same question. If John is preaching a baptism of forgiveness for the remission of sins, or the forgiveness of sins, why does Jesus need to take part of that? Doesn't, it didn't make sense to John, and it probably doesn't always make sense to us. Why was Jesus baptized? Well, for starters, it was because of the fact, we'll say this, it wasn't because of the fact that Jesus sinned. Jesus never sinned. The scriptures are very clear on that, right? He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, the book of Hebrews tells us. He never sinned, therefore he never needed to repent, right? We're already told that he's the Son of God, right? Verse 1, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What does that mean? Well, John chapter 5 tells us that. John chapter 5, if you understand what's going on in John chapter 5, verse 18, Jesus is confronting some of the leaders, and they were angry with him. Listen to this. Because he was calling God his own Father, listen to this, making himself equal with God right? God is light, and in him there is no darkness. God doesn't sin. God is holy. Jesus is God. Jesus never sinned. Not only did he never sin, Jesus could not sin. Now, all agree, those within Christianity, that Jesus never sinned. However, not everyone agreed that he could not sin. Right? He didn't sin, but some believe that maybe he possibly could sin. They argue that if he could not sin, that he would not really be like us. Right? Next week, we'll be looking at the temptation of Jesus, and it is argued that it was possible for him to sin, because if it wasn't possible for him to sin, then it's really not temptation. Or put another way, they say Jesus could not really be a man if he could not sin. However, The ability to sin does not make us human. Also, to be tempted by sin is not the same as sin. And then lastly, I would say this. Jesus had no human father. What we learn from Romans chapter 5 is that our, what we call our sin nature, is inherited by our father, Adam. Yet the second Adam, Jesus, was born of a virgin. He had no human father. Therefore, he did not inherit what we call the sin nature. Jesus did not sin, nor could he sin. Jesus, listen to this. Jesus is like us. He's human, but he's not exactly like us, right? We are 100% human. Jesus is 100% human, but he's also 100% God. He's the God-man. So he is like us but he's not exactly like us. Now, all that to say is that Jesus did not need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. He didn't need to repent. So why was he baptized? Two primary reasons. The first is that Jesus was baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. This is exactly what he told John in the next verse in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. Look at this. But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, that's John, permitted him to be 
baptize. Now, notice how Jesus didn't argue with John. Jesus didn't say, you know what, John, you got it wrong. I, I, I need it just like you do. He didn't argue with him. He agrees with him. In fact, he says, hey, you know what, just permit it to fulfill all righteousness. We're also told when God pronounces who Jesus is in verse 11, that he is his beloved son, and in his beloved son, what does it say? He is well pleased. Jesus did not sin, could not sin, but there is something that is right or righteous about being baptized. What does that mean? What does it mean? Why is it fitting and why is it righteous for Jesus to be baptized? And it's simply this. Jesus came to die for sinners. And in allowing himself to be baptized, he was declaring publicly and physically that he was ready to identify with sinners. So Jesus is baptized in order to identify with sinners. Listen to this. One uh, famous Bible teacher says it this way. He says, In the first act of his ministry, the one who had no public, excuse me, the one who had no sin publicly identified himself with those who had no righteousness. He goes on to say, The sinless lamb submitted to a baptism designed for sinners a foreshadowing of the fact that he would soon submit himself to a death deserved by sinners, unquote. So, by allowing himself to be baptized, Jesus, the Son of God, humbly identified himself with the sinners that he would later die for. He was declaring to the world that he came to defeat sin, to deal with sin. He came to deal with the sin of his people, and he needed to die in their place, and therefore he needed to identify with them in their sin. He was willing to do this. In fact, we're told later in one of Paul's letters that he was not only willing to identify with his people and identify with their sin, we are told that he is willing to be sin or be treated as a sinner for his people. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, He, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin. See, that's where we see Jesus didn't sin. Who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The reason he would die and was willing to die, is so that you and I could live. The reason he was willing to suffer or be treated as sin and be treated as unrighteousness is so that we could be righteous. Make no mistake, what Jesus did by being baptized and identifying with us in our sin is a massive expression of Jesus' humility when he came the first time. This is why I describe his baptism as profound humility. You know how we, when, when we hear of a celebrity who uses their fame and their fortune to benefit others? You know, we, we usually like that. We marvel at that. Like, for instance, if you know anything about Gary Sinise... He uses a lot of his time and his, his notoriety and his fame and his wealth to help out veterans and their families. And, and people look at that and, and they like that. It's like, wow, here's a man using who he is and what he has to benefit others. We also like the stories of uh, you know, celebrities visiting a famous restaurant that, that we can go to as well. We're like, wow, they were here too. I wonder if they sat here. Or we see their picture up on a wall. And we marvel at that. Because we see famous people living kind of like ordinary people. Or else there's the, the superhero celebrities, those, those actors and actresses who play superheroes in the movies when they visit hospitals to visit uh, sick children. And we think to ourselves like, wow, look at how they humbled themselves to benefit other people. Yet that's nothing compared to what we have going on here. Here is the very Son of the Almighty who came to identify with sinners. Think about it. The one who made everything by the word of his power. The one who spoke.
spoke the world into existence, who holds the universe in his hand, the one who controls what is seen and unseen, he left his throne in heaven and came to identify with sinners. You see why I say that's profound humility? In fact, I would say that Jesus' humility when he came to serve us is an example for us to follow. In fact, the Apostle Paul agrees with me. If you have your Bible, keep your thumb in Mark chapter 1. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. And I want you to hear what Paul has to say in reference to Jesus' humility. He says this, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also have but also for the interest of others. And then he gives us the reason why. Look at verse 5. Having this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see that? There never is a time when you or I, or anyone for that matter, there's never a time when we deserve to be selfish. No matter how much we think we deserve what we want or what we desire, no matter how much we think we deserve to be selfish at times because we've earned it, that is never true. We never deserve to be selfish. I had one of these moments a couple weeks ago. Things didn't go the way I planned. In fact, this was the week of my birthday. I had some plans for my birthday and 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 they they weren't going to pan out. And I threw a little temper tantrum and I went to bed mad because I didn't get what I wanted. Now, my reasoning was, as you can probably relate to, I was thinking to myself, you know, I work hard. I serve people. I, I, I don't mind doing it. I love doing it. I, I, I just want to get what I want sometimes. I mean, don't I deserve that? And so I go to bed mad. And then I wake up in the morning. And God reminds me how selfish I was thinking at that moment. It just so happened that I was studying Mark chapter 1. And, and I read of the, the profound humility of the Son of God. And as God does frequently, He takes His Word and smacks me over the head and says, who do you think you are? You think you deserve to be selfish? You think you're worthy to get what you want? That just happened to happen, right? I deserve what I want? <laughs> it's laughable. None of us deserve what we want. If the Son of God can humble Himself the way He did, we need to follow in His footsteps. We never deserve what we want. We never deserve what we feel. We have no rights to deserve what we want or get what we feel. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. I'm an American, so I actually do have some rights, right? I have the right to pursue, you know, uh, a life of freedom and happiness. Or you might even say, well, wait a minute, Carlos. I'm a, creation, I'm a creature. I'm a man or a, a, a woman. I'm a creature created in the very image of God. I have, the, I have dignity. I have worth. That's true. However, it doesn't take away from the fact that we have offended God with our sin. And even after having coming to know Him through His Son, we still offend God with our sin. In fact, think of it this way. When we sin against God, it's as though we gave him the middle finger and said, I will do what I want. Now you might be thinking, wow, did did he just say that? Yeah, I did. Because that's how offensive our sin is to God. And when we sin against him, and then later we think that we deserve what we want, or what we feel, that's laughable. The only one who is worthy is is God, 
And yet here he is in the person of the Son who humbled himself and identified himself with sinners. We need to follow his example. If he is worthy and willing to humble himself, so should we be willing to humble ourselves. Look at, notice how it's, it's a choice. Did you see in Philippians chapter 3? Look at, look at verse 3. It says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. It's a choice. Look at verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Humility is a choice. It's an act of the will. Humility is not a feeling, right? It doesn't matter how we feel. What matters is what is true. Who are we? Who is God? And what do we deserve? And how should we respond as he has commanded? It doesn't matter how we feel. We are not the center of the universe. Only he is. Now, you might be thinking, ah, come on, Carlos, I'm not, I'm not that bad. Really? Well, you're probably better than me. However, I'm not the standard. God is. Ask yourself this. Do you ever get impatient? Or how about this? Do you ever get angry or upset when things don't go your way? Do you ever despair because life is too difficult or, or because it's getting too tough? Or, or maybe you worry or have anxiety over things you can't control? You know why we struggle with those things and many others? It's because we think too highly of ourselves. We think we deserve to get what we want or what we feel. Now, you might say, okay, so I feel that way sometimes, but I don't always act on it. Busted. Because God knows how you feel. God knows what you think. He knows what's in your mind. He knows what's in your heart, right? That little temper tantrum I told you I threw a couple weeks ago, I didn't express that extravagantly. It was mostly right here on the inside. And God knew it and therefore convicted me of it. Humility is a choice that is motivated by the truth of who God is and who we are in his sight. It, we, we agree with God's word. That's where humility starts. The word tells us to humble ourselves and tells us why. And then here we have the example of Jesus who was willing to leave heaven and identify with sinners so that you and I might have life. We humble ourselves, not when we feel like it, we humble ourselves because we choose to, and we choose to follow Jesus' example. Now, God doesn't say, all right, figure it out, and you're on your own. Well, he gives us his word, and he gives us the spirit who enables us to obey that command, to be humble. In fact, I would say, every day, the first act of humility that you should make is cry out to God and say, I need your help, and then follow that up by reading his word, and that will enable you to be humble and follow Jesus' example. So, We've seen he's willing to come from an obscure, little unknown town called Nazareth. He was willing to humble himself in order to be our Savior. And for this reason, in the last two verses, this is why God the Father and God the Holy Spirit will attest to what I call the penetrating greatness of Jesus. The penetrating greatness of Jesus. Look at verse 10. Look what it says. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens saying, you are my beloved son and you I'm well pleased. Verse 10, that word immediately. This is the first time Mark uses it in his gospel. And I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago that this is one of his favorite words. In fact, he'll use it I think like 10 times in chapter 1 alone. By the time the book is ended, he'll have used it 41 times. He loves this book, this word, immediately. Why? Because it's a a word that communicates how fast-paced he means to tell the story of Jesus. Now, early uh, church history tells us that the gospel, uh, according to Mark, was written for a primarily Roman audience, or the Roman culture. And Romans were people of action, Right? They respected action and power. And so we'll see Mark will use this word immediately a lot just kind of to convey this fast pace that would have appealed to a Roman audience. Now, it says when he comes out of the water, both God his Father and God the Holy Spirit bear witness and attest to who he is. Right? Mark has already made the claim in verse 1 that Jesus is the Son of God. Here is more proof that God the Father and God the Son attest to the fact that he is the Son of God. 
Here the Holy Spirit attests to his identity and his mission by physically and visibly descending upon Jesus. Right? Now, we're told that it says the Spirit like a dove descended upon him. Now, it could be that the Spirit appeared as a dove, or it could be that as a dove descends, so did the Spirit. could be either one. What the, the issue is, is that there was a visible, physical representation of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And what it, what it symbolized or attested to was that Jesus is the Messiah and that Jesus has God's approval. This is the beginning of what we call Jesus' public ministry. In fact, we can even think of it this way. This is Jesus' coronation as far as him being the Messiah. Look what Mark says. It says, immediately after he comes up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening. You see that word opening? Mark literally says that heavens were torn apart. And this is a sign of God coming down. Look, up, if you have your, 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 uh, your Bible, ch- turn to Isaiah 64, verse 1, or you can look at the screen. I have it on there. And it says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens. This is Isaiah writing, speaking of God, that you would rend the heavens and come down to the mountain and that the mountains might quake at your presence. So this descent of the Holy Spirit was a fulfillment of God coming down in the person of Jesus. The Spirit anointed him and identified him as the Son of God. Now, Isaiah also says this in Isaiah 61, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 61, verse 1. I'll try to get it up on the screen, but we are having technical difficulties here in the studio. Did it come up? All right, Isaiah 61, 1. I'll read it to you. This is what it says, and you'll see how it, it connects with what's going on here. It says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. So, when you look at Isaiah 61, and Jesus will actually quote that later on in the synagogue, that the Spirit, has, the Spirit of God has descended upon him, identifying him as the Messiah, and as the Son of God. That's what's going on here. Let me find my place here. Okay. The Holy Spirit anointed Jesus the beginning of his public ministry in order to testify that he is the Son of God, that he is here to deal with sin and free them from the captivity and slavery of sin. We'll talk about that more later on. Now, we also see that the Father, God his Father, also attests to who Jesus is. So we see visibly the Spirit comes and then audibly the voice of God utters these words. You are my beloved Son and you I am well pleased. Now, when you look at the original grammar here, it's literally Jesus, or, or God the Father repeats you twice. It's as though he's saying you. You are my Son for emphasis. And he's identifying Jesus. And the Father is saying basically with a resounding declaration that Jesus was his son. Where else do we see that? Well, are the slides on? Can you turn to where it says Psalm 2-7? You got that up? Psalm 2-7 says this. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Now, that verse in Psalm 2 is Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, speaking of his son. And then if you go on to read later in Psalm 2, it says that Yahweh, the Father, all and the Son, both, receive worship. What does that mean? It means that both the Son and the Father are equally God because only God is to receive 
worship. And yet we also see that the Lord, whom we call the Father in that passage, is distinct from the Son. They are not the same, and yet they're equal. They are both God and deserve worship. So, I mean, what, another thing we see going on here in this passage is the, the biblical record or truth of what we call the trinity of God or the fact that God is one God, but he exists also in three persons, right? The Father is not the Son, nor is he the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father, nor the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son, but both Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all one God, right? Here, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. There's only one God and yet three persons. And here is a record of it in Mark chapter 1. The, what we call the Trinity, or we can even say the, the triunity of God. Now, how can God only be one God and yet three persons? We don't know. You're probably thinking, wow, that's profound. We don't know how that's true. We just know it's true because that's how God has communicated to us in his word and has revealed himself to us. We just know that it's true because that's what God says and that's who God is. God is one God and yet exists in three persons. Why? Because that's what the Bible, in other words, that's what God says. He says that's who he is and we believe him. Now, by declaring that Jesus is the Son of God here, the Father is saying that he is just like me. He is God as I am God. In other words, both the Holy Spirit and the Father are saying he's the Son of God, he's the long-awaited Messiah, he's the one to come and deal with sin and take it away. Essentially, like I said earlier, here's where Jesus is coronated as king. The Father from heaven with his voice and the Holy Spirit visibly descending as a dove coronates Jesus and said, this is the Messiah. This is the King of Israel. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, there could be no greater witness to who Jesus was at the beginning of his ministry other than God himself, his Father, and God the Holy Spirit. And that's what's going on here. That's why when you think about it, this is profound. The profound greatness of Jesus, the one who humbled himself, is in fact God. This is the God-man. So when we think about, okay, how confident can we be that from this point on, Jesus is going to do what he said he's going to do? Or even now from our perspective, after the cross has already been taken care of, when we think about, is he able to, is he capable of fulfilling all of his promises? Did he really pay for our sins? Did he really purchase redemption? Yes, he did. Because he is God. The very God who has always existed existed. No one can overcome him. No one can assail him. This is his penetrating greatness. He, the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, our Savior, came to deal with our sin. And we can be confident that he has dealt with our sin and will deal with our sin. So, by way of application, we read earlier in Psalm, or excuse me, Isaiah 61, it said this, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, listen to this, to bring good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. In that verse, there's three realities in Isaiah 61, 1, concerning our relationship to sin. More specifically, what sin has done and does to us. And the first is that sin afflicts us. Sin afflicts us. It's oppressive. It's like a harsh slave owner who mistreats us and beats us down. Sin is destructive. It's damaging to our lives. It breaks our relationship with God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and it ruins our relationship with other people. Sin, we are afflicted by sin. Right? We are also, it's, servants or slaves sin is our master and in the same way a slave could not free themselves neither can we free ourselves from sin apart from the son of god 
And yet here is the Son of God who comes to the afflicted, who comes to the broken harder to bind, to fix what's wrong with us, to free us from its captivity and its power. Here comes the King, the Son of the living God, who takes away the sin of the world. And from this point on and forward, and even still from this day when Jesus comes back, Jesus has the ability and the power to overcome our sin, to free us from its affliction, from its power, and from its destructive nature in our own lives. Sin is no longer, if you're in Christ, your master. You are no longer its slave. You are no longer under its power and penalty because of what Jesus did. We do not have to give in to it anymore. We can have freedom from our sin here and now because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. However, we don't always live according to that freedom, do we? In fact, we frequently are afflicted by sin and its effects. And we give in to it, and to its destructive nature and its power. In fact, many times, you know, like, like a millionaire who lives like a, a poor person who, do, who has all this wealth but doesn't use it. Sometimes that's how we live. We have this freedom and this ability to not give in to our sin. We have this, all these riches in the redemption that Jesus has purchased for us, but we don't live in it. Now you might be saying, well, how does that look? Well, here's one primary way in which we don't live in the power and the freedom that Jesus gave us when we're not willing to address our own sin that is still present in our own lives, right? Ignoring our sin doesn't make it go away. I've actually heard people say that they don't go to the doctor even though they, they know something's wrong with their body and they don't even investigate what's going on because they don't want to hear the truth. Like, I don't want to hear that I'm sick or I have this disease. As if it's going to go away if you ignore it. Sometimes we do that with our sin. We don't address it. We ignore it. And yet, it's like a destructive cancer that continues to eat away at our soul and will beat us down and will continue to afflict us until we address it and cut it out of our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the redemption that Jesus has given us as King. The first step in cutting out sin is addressing it in our lives. Jesus gives us the power and the ability to do that. He came to bring good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to free the captives who had been once slaves to sin. Now, that is, now you know this. It doesn't mean we don't still sin anymore. What it does mean is that when we do, we can have the ability to resist temptation and overcome our sin because of who God is. We have come to know the triune God that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit through God the Son, Jesus. We can come and beg for forgiveness based on Jesus' uh, death on the cross and God will forgive us, cleanse us, and enable us to get back on the path of obedience. He gives us the Spirit who lives in us and He gives us His Word in order to live in that freedom and no longer be afflicted. That, brothers and sisters, is the penetrating greatness of Jesus. Amen? So, in summary, the baptism of Jesus is, is this. Similar, yet different. Jesus' baptism is ultimately the affirmation that He is the Savior we desperately need. That's what the baptism was all about. He identified with us and demonstrated to us how much we need him. Amen. So, let's see if we got any questions. Did we? We did not. All right. So, either that was very thorough or there's only a few of you watching. That's okay. So, Lord willing, next week the weather will be okay. We'll be back here in the gym and we'll be able to worship the Lord together through music, prayer, and the preaching of His Word. I will say before I say goodbye that we, I had communicated to some of you that we had an announcement to make in regards to our future, but the elders have decided to wait on that, and we'll let you know next week.
So I'm sorry you got to wait another week, but I think you'll be thankful that we're all together when we make that news known. So, Lord willing, see you next week. Let me pray, and we'll be done. God, thank you for all that you do through your word. Thank you for the person of Jesus and his great example to us. May you use your word to give us the confidence of walking in Christ and what that means, to humble us that we might follow his example, and ultimately be faithful to you until he comes back for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next Sunday.